Hello, and welcome to Mission Watch for Mission 51L. I'm Barbara Morgan, the backup teacher in space. Today, I'm speaking to you from the Kennedy Space Center outside of Orlando in Florida. This area might look familiar to you. It's the area you've seen when you've watched other televised launches. Let's take a look around the area behind me here at the Kennedy Space Center. There is the famous time clock that helps us count down to liftoff. About three and a half miles behind the countdown clock, you'll see launch pad A. It's a little hard to see there, but it's way back in the distance. All the shuttle launches we've had so far have occurred from pad A. As our view takes us toward launch pad B, you'll first see a large nitrogen tank off in the distance. There it is. That tank is part of what NASA calls the gas farm. That's where we store the liquid fuels. And there's launch pad B. The Challenger is there, ready to launch this Sunday. This Sunday will be the very first time a shuttle has been launched from pad B. Launch pad B was used to launch Saturn rockets during our Apollo days. It has been modified so that it can launch shuttles now. The waterway that you see is home to many fish and birds. It serves other purposes, too. The astronauts do their emergency water training here. The shuttle's large orange fuel tank, which we call the external tank, is brought here to the Kennedy Space Center by barge through this water. Those bleachers that you see are empty now, but come this Sunday, they'll be filled with people. Some of the thousands of people who will be here to watch Krista and the crew blast into space. Just to the left of the bleachers is the VAB, or Vehicle Assembly Building. It is where the shuttle is tilted upright and attached to the external tank and the solid rocket boosters before it is moved out to the launch pad. Just to give you an idea of how large that building is, take a look at that flag that's been painted on the outside. Would you believe that each stripe on that flag is wide enough, it is so wide that a bus could drive on it? The Kennedy Space Center sits on a National Wildlife Refuge. Just yesterday, I was able to see an alligator, a couple turtles, a group of wild pigs, and many, many birds. Just to name a few of the birds, I saw egrets, gulls, pelicans, herons, and I was fortunate to see an eagle. I heard a wonderful story here yesterday from a new friend I've met here at Kennedy Space Center named Mr. Cotti. He told me a story. He was sitting just about where I'm sitting now, and he saw an eagle swoop down, knock an armadillo over, go around in a circle, come down and pick up that eagle with its talons and fly off. So between man and nature, there's a lot of exciting things going on here at KSC. As you noticed, at launch pad B, the Challenger is ready to go. Our first teacher in space, Krista McAuliffe, and the crew arrived here yesterday from the Johnson Space Center in Texas. In a few minutes, we'll get to see their arrival. Here we go. They're arriving in their T-38s. There's Krista and Dick Scobie, the commander, some of their family and friends. There you see Judy Resnick, mission specialist. They're going into quarantine, which means they're staying in a special area where only a few people are allowed to see them. There are several reasons for their being in quarantine. The first, of course, is to keep them from being exposed to cold and, germ to cold and flu germs so that they'll be healthy for their mission. Also, they need to shift their sleep cycle so that they'll go, be going to bed and waking up at the same times they'll be doing that during their mission. This gives them time also to concentrate on their upcoming mission. It's a last minute chance for family and friends to hug them goodbye. That package that Chris has just received is a package of t-shirts from New Hampshire given to the crew members. When Mission 51L launches, there will be seven crew members, but there are thousands of people who make that mission possible and successful. With me today is Gene Rock, operations engineer in the future planning department, who will describe for us what goes on here at Kennedy Space Center behind the scenes to make this launch successful. Gene, how do we get the shuttle ready for the mission? Barbara, I think this one's all ready, and if this wind keeps up, it's going to fly any moment. <laughs> on, on its own, isn't it? <laughs> Our job here, of course, is to take all of the components that come to us from all over the country. 
we get the objects that are going into space from some parts of the country. We get the external tank from Mississippi. We get solid rocket boosters from Utah. And of course, we got the orbiters originally from California. And of course, it takes a lot of people to prepare them to send them to us. And then we, in turn, have to put all of these together. Not an easy task, I might say. <laughs> well, it takes a lot of people. But we not only put them together, but before we put them together, we have to test them, check them out, and make sure that everything is working perfectly. And then, when we know that everything is working perfectly, we have to put the pieces together and again check it to make sure that after it's integrated or all combined, that again, it works as it should. Okay. And then, of course, the big thing that we're here for, when it's all together, everything is working just right, then we're ready for the big day, which is launch day, which we hope to be very soon now. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have a short tape here that I think you'd be very interested in that goes through the sequence of events that we actually accomplish here in preparing one for launch. And then afterwards, I'm sure you'll have some questions and we'll go through those too. Excellent. I know I'll have plenty of questions for you. Good. consists of three major components. The orbiter, two solid rocket boosters, and the external fuel tank. The two solid rocket boosters arrive by a railroad car in segments. They are assembled on the mobile launcher platform inside the vehicle assembly building. The 149-foot-tall solid rocket boosters provide the majority of the thrust at liftoff. The external fuel tank arrives by barge at Kennedy Space Center. This 15-story tank provides over one-half million gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen to the orbiter's main engines and is the only expendable shuttle component. After arrival, the external tank is taken to a high bay inside the vehicle assembly building and attached to the solid rocket boosters. The remaining space shuttle component is, of course, the orbiter. We have a fleet of four reusable orbiters, Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, and Atlantis. The orbiter spaceship is 122 feet in length and has a wingspan of 78 feet, about the size of a small jet passenger plane. Orbiters land at Kennedy Space Center on a 15,000-foot runway designed specifically for them. Upon arrival, the orbiter is towed to its sophisticated aircraft hangar, the orbiter processing facility, where cargo loading, equipment modifications, and minor repairs are performed. After processing, the orbiter is towed into the vehicle assembly building, where a 250-ton crane lifts it into a vertical position. It is then placed into the high bay and made it to the external tank. All systems have passed inspection. The shuttle is carried out to the launch pad on a crawler transporter. There are two crawler transporters at Kennedy Space Center. These massive track vehicles are the largest of their kind in the world, weighing over 6 million pounds. The crawlers were designed and built in the 1960s for use in the Apollo Saturn V lunar program. Today, more than 20 years later, they are still serving us well. Four huge hydraulic pistons at each corner of the crawler transporter keep its deck level while climbing the gradual slope leading to the launch pad. Moving at a top speed of one mile per hour, it usually takes about five and a half hours to transport the shuttle from the vehicle assembly building to the launch pad. Approximately two weeks of preparation and tests are completed prior to launch. While the flight hardware is being prepared for the mission, the cargo it will carry into space receives a final checkout. Some payloads must be assembled and handled in a vertical position. In the clean room environment of the vertical processing facility, satellites are attached to special pallets and functionally checked with ground support equipment. When checkout is complete, the cargo is loaded into a payload canister in the vertical position and transported to the rotating service structure at the launch pad. The payload is then mounted in a payload changeout room and transferred to the orbiter's cargo bay. The cargo bay allows the shuttle to carry up to 65,000 pounds into space. The interior is 60 feet long by 15 feet in diameter and could easily hold a railroad tank car or a NASA tour bus. Horizontal payloads, such as Space Lab, are processed in a different facility 
known as the Operations and Checkout Building. They are then taken to the orbiter processing facility where they are installed in the cargo bay prior to the orbiter's move to the vehicle assembly building. In addition to the large vertical and horizontal payloads, the shuttle carries getaway specials into space. These are self-contained experiment packages belonging to private businesses, schools, or even individuals. They are mounted in the cargo bay while the orbiter is in the orbiter processing facility and are flown on a space available basis on most shuttle missions. Well, what did you think of that, Barbara? Well, Gene, it is so impressive how many steps and how many people are involved in getting each mission successful. And I wanted to um, ask you, if we were to take one small part of the whole shuttle system, let's take one of the solid rocket boosters, how is just that one part prepared for launch? Can you tell us all the steps? <laughs> yeah, except, Barbara, you picked a good one, and that's not exactly one small part. Would you believe that each of these boosters is only two feet shorter than the Statue of Liberty. And furthermore, it weighs more than three times as much as the Statue of Liberty, each My one goodness. of them. That really shows us how big the whole thing is all together then, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> and of course, it has propellant inside of it because it's a solid rocket propellant. And each of the two has over 555 tons of propellant in it. My goodness. How and do we get it ready? How do we get it here at the to the launch site? Okay, it takes a lot longer than we actually use it because all of that propellant is used up in about two and a half minutes. But we have used the casings before in many cases. So when it comes down in the ocean... By the casings, you mean the outer... The outer, outer, the outer shell of it, okay. right. And we tow it back in from the ocean about 140 nautical miles away and bring it up to a facility where we clean it up very good. Now this is from the Atlantic Ocean? From the right Atlantic to Ocean, Kennedy's in through Space. Port Canaveral, and right up to a facility here near the Kennedy Space Center. Okay. And we clean it up good and then separate it into the four segments that we will send back to Utah where they put the propellant in it. And how do they get to Utah? By rail car. Okay. And they load the propellant there and then they bring them back to us with the propellant inside ready to use on another launch. But in the meantime, here at the Kennedy Space Center, we have been taking the forward section and refurbishing it with instrumentation in this part up here at the top and the three large parachutes that lower the casing into the water in, during the flight are located in this tapered portion up here. And then there's a drogue chute at the very top and an aft skirt on the back. So you can see that a lot of work is being done here at the same time the casings have gone back to Utah to be reloaded so we can use them again. Now those parachutes, are they used over and over again? Yes, they're used over and over again and we have to thoroughly wash them and dry them after each use prior to its next use. And is there a crew of people who are just responsible for the parachutes? There is a crew of people and a parachute facility it's like a great big car wash. I'll be done. Probably the I'll biggest one in the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And then there's another group of people who actually put the solid rocket boosters together with the external tank? Oh, yes. They have to be stacked individual segments at a time on a mobile launcher platform. And once we have them both in place, then we put the external tank in place. And that's another crew that helps do oh, all that. Oh, that's another story in itself because we brought it from Mississippi by barge down around the southern tip of Florida, up the east coast of Florida, in through Port Canaveral, offloaded here by another crew, raise it to the vertical, and that is 15 stories high. My goodness. Well, Gene, I just want to tell you that, you know, this is just one small part, although it's large, it's one small part of the whole system, and it just gives us an idea of how many people are involved in this whole thing. And both Chris and I have thought that we'd love to have all the people who have had anything to do with Mission 51L stand out there by launch pad B, and let's take a picture of them all, and I bet they wouldn't fit in 10 <laughs> photographs. <laughs> I think you'd have to use a satellite to take the photograph. I think so, too. Well, thanks, Gene, for joining me. My pleasure. We've just seen how the orbiter and its payloads are processed here at the Kennedy Space Center. The Challenger has been on the pad now for about five weeks. And now, with the launch just one and a half days away, let's find out what happens between now and launch time. With me now is Hugh Harris. He's NASA's Chief of Public Information, and I might add that just like Gene, he knows an awful lot about NASA. 
He works here at the Kennedy Space Center. Hugh, can you tell us what happens now until the Challenger blasts off with Krista in it this Sunday morning? Well, first of all, I think we need to talk about what a countdown actually is. And I think that many people don't realize it's simply a checklist that has all of the items that need to be done in order to get a rocket ready to fly. And in the case of the space shuttle, we have uh, four volumes of about 2,000 pages, just lists of things that need to be done. And uh, for each rocket, it's different. For the smaller ones, like the Atlas Centaurs, there's less. And for the shuttle, of course, there's more. Now, have you read through all these volumes yourself? <laughs> no, I've, I've looked at all of them, but I haven't read every word. Uh, but I look at them as they go through it uh, when doing commentary. Uh, we picked up the countdown uh, yesterday at the T-minus 43-hour point. And since that time, we've done many things. And the, the most recent was to put aboard the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen that is used for making electricity in the fuel cells. I see. Now, is that the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen in the external tank in that large orange structure? Or no. is it elsewhere? Yeah, no, that is in, uh, in other tanks. We uh, will go into a hold uh, later this evening. And when we come out of that, we'll prepare to put the great amounts of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen into the external tank. And that is what is used to power the, the small, uh, well, relatively small mm -hmm. engines which are on the orbiter. Uh, the, that's the, the next step. And once we have done that, then we're ready to wake up the crew and get them out to the pad. We don't wake up the crew until we're absolutely sure everything's going well because we don't want them to be on board for too long. They're going to have a long day in space. We want them to be rested to do everything that they need to do in their top condition. But do you think that they're really sleeping? <laughs> well, some crews do wake up early. <laughs> and, they, uh, okay. and I know that they do get excited and they're anxious to get out there and they're anxious to go. Oh, I they do. The, uh, Next, uh, the final steps, really, are taken over by computers at the T-minus nine-minute point. And by T-minus nine, you mean the launch time minus nine minutes? That's right, minutes. yes, okay. nine minutes before launch. Okay. And then they monitor all of the thousands of measurements which have to be taken down to the time in which uh, we lift off. For instance, we uh, some of the things that happen are we move the swing arm back that's used, for the, the Go ahead. Uh, that's used by the astronauts to walk over to the orbiter, and then we get the hydraulic uh, power units up, and uh, then when we're ready to go, we ignite the engines. This is what it looks like. ISO go. Okay, unlock next right here. You go. Go. PPS OTC. PPS go. HYD OTC. DVD OTC. DVD is go. DWS. DWS is go. DOFM. DOFM go. AFM. AFM go. CLS. CLS go. CCME. CCME go. MDL. MDL go. DPSS. DPSS go. And DMCC. Fourteen, thirteen, twelve, eleven, ten. We are go for main engine ignition. Eight, seven, six. We have main engine ignition. horsepower at work. At two minutes into the flight, 25 miles high and 28 miles downrange, the solid rocket boosters separate from the orbiter and are parachuted into the Atlantic Ocean. Two specially built recovery ships await to retrieve them. The casings and parachutes are recovered and returned to Cape Canaveral Air Force Station for cleaning and refurbishment. are then transported to 
Utah for reloading with solid propellant for use on another shuttle mission. The external tank remains with the orbiter until separation occurs at 57 miles up and 780 miles downrange. The orbiter continues into space as the tank re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, breaks into several pieces, and falls into the ocean. Two small rocket engines are used to place the shuttle in its final predetermined orbit around the Earth. One of the first critical tasks is to open the payload bay doors. Above the spectacular panorama of Earth, the work begins. This <laughs> Even though there's only seven people on board the orbiter as it goes into orbit, there's hundreds and, and actually thousands of people who are taking care of those people in orbit all around the world. Well, I just, I just came from Johnson Space Center. I know there are a lot of people there working. Where are these other people who are around the world helping out with this mission? Well, at the time of launch, we have people at what we call the transatlantic abort sites. These are landing fields, in this case in Africa and Casablanca, Morocco. Clear where, on the other side of the world. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Where the orbiter might come down if there were an emergency. We also have people out at Edwards Air Force Base, which if we had an emergency where we could go around the Earth, uh, they might land. And of course we have people at our landing strip here which are not concerned with the launch at all, but they're concerned with uh, the orbiter if they should have to come back to the Kennedy Space Center. But one thing I think that your uh, listeners might be interested in is that the astronauts uh, who are seen usually during their duties up in space really do a lot of things on the ground too. We have uh, teams of astronauts which come here to the Kennedy Space Center and also go to the many manufacturers uh, and follow the various hardware as it's being built and gotten ready for launch. Here at the Kennedy Space Center, that group is called the Cape Crusaders, and that includes people like the astronaut support person. And who, what is the astronaut support person, and what does that person do? Well, the astronaut support person uh, helps the crew. Uh, first of all, he prepares the cabin for the crew to get into. He, he positions the switches for the ingress. And then when the crew comes on board, he What gets, do you mean by ingress? <laughs> well, getting into the cabin okay. of the orbiter. Okay. And uh, when he gets in, uh, when they get in, he straps them into their seats and makes sure that their uh, communications, their oxygen, all that sort of thing is hooked up properly and that everything that's not needed is taken out of the orbiter's cabin. So the astronaut support person would be the last person to see them before they blast into space? Well, that's true, except on television. Except on television, great. Okay, well, the crew will be going in early Sunday morning, and right. I believe that the astronaut support person for this mission is Sonny Carter. And That's true. I had a the for, fortunate, um, I was very fortunate in being able to meet him, and I think he'll do a good job strapping them in. After Sonny straps in the crew, they will be, of course, launching, and that historic launch with Krista in there, and we're all very excited to see that. And they've got a lot of work to do, and let's review some of the activities that that crew will be doing on Mission 51L. Want to hand me the Tetris? There we go. They have two satellites to deploy. The first one is the Tetris satellite. Now, you actually saw a picture of the Tetris satellite in the film that Gene showed us. However, it looked very, very different from this. This is what the Tetris looks like after it has been completely opened up and it is working in space. It is a large communication satellite. In fact, TEDRA stands for Tracking Data Relay Satellite. And NASA uses it to track the shuttle, to track other satellites, and also to relay messages between Earth and the satellites and the shuttle. The TEDRAS is quite large. When this is completely opened up, it measures 40 feet here and 60 feet across here. Now, that means it would take about two very large classrooms for this to sit in. Secondly, on the third day of the mission, they're going, excuse me, they're going to be launching another satellite. This is called the Spartan Halley. The Spartan Halley sits in the upper front part of the payload bay. Let's open this up so you can see here. Now, the Spartan Halley here looks quite large compared to this orbiter, but it's just because the model is a little bit small. The Spartan Halley sits in the payload bay up front. The Tedris is sitting towards the back. After the Tedris has been launched, a couple days later, we'll launch the Spartan Halley. It's going to be launched a little bit differently. Judy Resnick, the mission specialist, is going to work the arm inside the shuttle, which will reach over, grab the satellite, 
and put it out into space. It will orbit on its own for 48 hours, and it's going to be studying, excuse me, studying Comet Halley and trying to figure out what Comet Halley is made up of. Two days later, the crew will go back to the Spartan Halley satellite, pick it up, put it back in the payload bay, and bring it back to Earth so the scientists can study the data. Okay, there are several other activities going on on board. The crew will be studying how fluids work in space. They're going to be taking pictures out the window of Comet Halley using a special camera. And there are three student experiments on board. They are part of NASA's program to encourage student involvement in our space program. One of these experiments will look into how chicken embryos develop in space. Another will look into how crystals form, and the third one is looking into how do we can make metals stronger in space. Now, of course, the thing we've been waiting for the most is to watch Krista teach her lessons from space. There has been a change in that date because we are not launching tomorrow, as you know. We're going to be launching Sunday morning. So Krista's lessons, rather than being on the sixth day, are going to be on the fourth day of the mission, and you will be able to pick those up live on PBS stations. Her first lesson, again, is called the ultimate field trip, and she's going to show us how we live in space. Her second lesson is called where we've been, where we're going, and why. And in that lesson, she's going to show us why we're living in space. And I think you'll find both of them very fascinating. We're very excited, too, to be able to have students ask questions to Krista while she's up in space. Her students in Concord, New Hampshire, and my students in McCall, Idaho, will have a chance to ask her questions for about five minutes. When we lose her signal, then they'll be able to continue asking questions to me for a short period of time. Of course, Krista is going to be busy not only giving those two lessons, but she has several demonstrations she's going to give. I'm going to wait for that plane to fly over so that you can hear me better. <laughs> Hearing planes fly is real typical around here. <laughs> Krista's demonstrations, you won't be able to see those live, but they will be filmed and they will be brought back to your classroom sometime after her mission. She will be giving scientific demonstrations. She's going to show you how magnets work in space. She's going to show you what happens to bubbles in space. She's going to demonstrate Newton's laws. She's going to show how pigments separate in space in a demonstration called chromatography. And she's going to show us about simple machines and how they work in space. Okay. We'll give you more background on all of these activities, and we'll give you daily updates on Mission 51L through our Mission Watch program, which is scheduled for every weekday during Krista's flight. Another fascinating event which, taking, which is taking place right now is our Voyager Uranus encounter. Our Voyager 2 spacecraft, which was launched nine years ago, is flying by the planet Uranus. You'll be able to catch all the information by watching this program. Remember, you can watch Mission Watch, all special events on Mission 51L, and the Voyager Uranus Encounter on one of these two different satellites. If you have any questions at all about our Mission Watch program, you may contact Classroom Earth by calling area code 815-664-4500, or if you have a computer and a modem, you may call area code 817-526-8686. Thank you so much for joining us today on Mission Watch for Mission 51L. Enjoy the launch. We know you will. And we'll see you on the next Mission Watch program Monday morning, 1030 Central Standard Time. Thank you very much.